Welcome. Good evening. Thank you for joining us today. We'll just give it a few moments for people to arrive and then we'll begin. Again, welcome, good evening. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Emily and beha on behalf of Teachers College Press, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to everyone joining us for the book launch event of Strong Black Girls, Reclaiming Schools in Their Own Image, which was recently published by Teachers College Press. Uh, this book, if I can just introduce it to you very briefly, is an edited volume, including the work of a number of contributors with the goal of amplifying the routinely muffled voices and experiences of black women and girls in schools. Through essays, storytelling, letters and poetry, the contributors of this volume lay bare the harm that black women and girls are expected to overcome in order to receive an education in America. But the authors make clear that the strength of black women and girls should not be merely defined as the ability to survive racism, abuse and violence, but that readers should also see in the book themes of resistance and resilience that emerge from what is a group of really reflective coming of age narratives. We are very fortunate and grateful to have with us here today, the three co-editors of this volume, Dr. Daniela Pugo, who is assistant professor of education at Virginia Commonwealth University, Dr. Lynette Mawinney, who is an associate professor and chair of the Department of Urban Education at Rutgers University, Newark, and Dr. Afia M. Billy Shaka, assistant professor of clinical psychology at the University of the District of Columbia. Before I turn it over to the editors, I just wanna offer a couple points of housekeeping. Uh, first, we are recording today and we will be sending the recording via email to all the registrants. So please do share it with your colleagues who are unable to join us today. Uh, second, we are offering a discount on the book at the Teachers College Press website. So please consider buying the book and please look for the information on how to access that discount in the chat panel. Finally, this event will run for one hour and we will be fielding questions from the audience at the end. So please ask your questions using the Zoom Q&A feature and we'll do our best to get to those at the end of the hour. Feel free to use the chat panel as well to introduce yourself and say hello. We're so delighted to have so many guests with us here tonight to discuss and celebrate this wonderful collection of work. Uh, so please get comfortable, say hello, tell us where you're joining us from. And uh, we want to hear your thoughts and questions, so please speak up. Um, and at this point, I'm going to invite the editors to introduce themselves, tell us a little bit more about their backgrounds in a bit more detail, their professional work and the origins of strong black girls. So Dr. Apuga, would you like to start us off? I, you're, you're muted. I did that in my class like two hours ago. So <laughs> um, I just wanna say thank you everybody who's joined. Um, thank you for taking the time out. I know many of you out there are, are Zoomed out um, and I don't want, know what your day was like, but I just wanna welcome you to this space and thank you so much for your support. Um, my name is uh, Danielle and I am Assistant Professor of Education at um, Virginia Commonwealth University in the Department of Teaching and Learning, also um, affiliate with IQ Core, um, where we um, investigate disrupting criminalization in education. Um, so I'm, I'm really, really happy to be here. My background is a teacher. Um, so I'm a traditionally trained teacher and I'm so um, blessed and fortunate to have ended up in this space to be able to sort of see that whole evolution of being in practice and then also now seeing it from um, this perspective and hoping to um, to, to, to continue to add to um, our wonderful um, trajectory of knowledge we have around this particular subject. So thank y'all. Thank you so much for being here. Hi, everyone. My name is Lynette Mawinney. I am Associate Professor and Chair of the Department of Urban Education at Rutgers Newark. Um, I also, my background is also as a teacher. I was an English teacher in uh, Philadelphia. And uh, I just want to reiterate Danielle's point of saying thank you for being here, especially in a world where we're, we're on Zoom a lot. I feel like I go from the computer to the bed and back to the computer and in the bed. <laughs> it's a little Groundhog Day-ish. Um, but thank you for being here. Uh, this was certainly a passion project um, and spanned over a few years. But we also want to just say, take this opportunity to say thank you to the authorship of the book. Um, some of them are here and they're joining us today too. So, um, and for sharing their voices. Absolutely. 
Yeah, I definitely echo that. I'm Dr. Fia and Billy Shaka. I'm a clinical psychologist, but I love all things Black girls. So I'm so excited that we got the opportunity um, to publish a book on that topic. So thank you to Teachers College Press for accepting our manuscript to get this work and the voices of Black women heard. I'm so excited. I'm like, I see my mom on there. I see my <laughs> siblings and students. So thank you all so much for joining us tonight. I, I was telling um, a friend of mine who's on here that it didn't feel real like we had a book yet because we didn't have a launch. So I'm so excited that Teachers College Press put this together for us to have community um, to discuss the oh so very important topic of Black girls in school. So even though I'm not trained in education, I definitely am an educator and have my own experiences of being a Black girl in school. So I'm so glad to, to um, express this journey of arriving to this moment. And these other women are so dope too. So shout out to Lynette and shout out to Danielle for, for um, this collaboration. Thanks girl. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I wanna, you know, round it all up and say the contributors, the contributors, the contributors um, who as, as many of you may know, or if, uh, for folks who are not um, too um, savvy on the, the book editing or book writing process, it's it's a lot. And so oftentimes you just go into it with this idea of like, this has to be done. This is the fire in my belly. I have to get, you know, I want people to engage and be excited about it. But the contributors really made the work take shape because they were able to create and craft our thinking around, okay, this is, this is what we think we wanna say, but this is really what we need to be saying. And so, you know, that that's just the beauty of, of just coming into something with an open mind and an open heart um, and really just centering and leveraging and wanting to engage and really bombard the narrative with black girl voices in schools. And so that's that's really what we set out to do. And that is our hope is that this this is like the very tip of the iceberg that this is propelled into you know, multiple spaces and multiple people lifting up and wanting to um, engage into, in, in this topic in whatever way, whatever platform um, that's available. So that's, that's really the, the, the hope and reach of, of what we set out to do. That's great. Thank you so much for those, uh, those introductions. Um, and I, I think what I'd like to talk about next is something that you were just getting into, Dr. Pugo. Um, it's, potentially a very uh, open ended question I'm posing here and potentially kind of a two part question, but I'd love to just pose this to the three of you and, and see where it takes us. Um, first, I'd like to hear more about the project in your own words, how, how it came about and the sorts of um, voices you feature the sort the the really the content of the book itself. Um, uh, above and beyond what we've said so far and, and secondly I'd really love it if we could explore. Um, how you'd like this book to be used, you know, whether whether that's incorporating it into teacher practice or teacher education programs or school psychology programs, um, but also more broadly, I, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this book as a sort of catalyst or a, a jumping off point to start having these other very serious conversations about bringing change about in our schools. Um, so yeah, just in a very open way, I'd, I'd like to invite any of you to uh, yeah, to first, any background on the book that you think would be helpful, and then with that context in place, uh, we can kind of dig into the question of um, what this book can be and the, the kinds of conversations and changes we want to see come out of it. Well, we can start with its origin story, maybe. <laughs> um, so the book came out of a book chapter that we originally pitched uh, for another edited book. And those editors actually said, you know, you what you actually have here could be an actual book. Right. Um, and so thankfully for the support of other Black female scholars, they kind of pushed us in this direction um, to do this book. And when we set out to do the book, we were, you know, the whole point was to, to capture these uh, Black women and Black girls' voices and to really put them in the narrative. But um, we were shocked at how many chapters we got 
that we got 85 uh, people <laughs> or chapters, I should say, so it was more than that on a, on a chapter, actually sent it in for submission to be accepted. Um, we were overwhelmed by the beauty of all of this that was happening, but also shows the reason of why we're trying to have this book is to put these voices out and clearly these voices want to be heard. Um, so with that, you know, we, we, we selected these chapters, but what's nice is the authorship in the book, we have, um, we have professors, we have grad students, we have a, a fifth grader, right? So there's, there's literally a variety of different women and girls experiences. And I think it comes at a, you know, I was thinking about this last week, I was watching the news, right? And, and some of you might have seen this where uh, here was another video of this, of a high school, I think it was 14, uh, black female who's getting body slammed and her head slammed in the concrete by, you know, the school cops. And so there's a lot that's happening in these spaces to black girls. We're starting to, you know, we're, we're seeing like books, books like pushed out um, about what is really happening. But this is a way for the, the, the women and the girls to actually have their voices be heard and how they're actually trying to reclaim all of that. So... I don't know if anyone wants to add anything else, but. Yeah, I, I would even add in terms of how I got to know um, Danielle originally and then how she connected me to Lynette, that Danielle and I were colleagues at the University of the District of Columbia, and we were studying um, Black girls' hair in school um, in terms of all of the different instances incidences that have informed the Crown Act, um, which is an anti-discrimination bill or law connected to protecting Black hair in schools and in, in work. But um, we were he seeing so many stories in my narrative data set about Black girls being punished um, by teachers because of their hairstyle or Black girls um, being shamed by their classmates because of hair. And that's just the aesthetics of it. And so I definitely entered this project a little differently because I'm not in the field of education, but thinking about the trauma that, in, that happens at schools and the necessary, necessary aspect of hearing and healing from those stories. So that was sort of the, the way that I got connected and felt passionate in, um, to this topic. And I, I do come from a family of educators. I have to tell you all this, my dad actually went to Teachers College, Columbia University for his doctorate in education. So um, both of my parents are educators and even my husband is one too. So to even think about, I, I didn't identify as one, but I think through this project, I was recognizing um, how key the educational experience is in identity development um, and self-concept. Absolutely. So echoing every all the all the things that both women just said, and I, you know, our origin story of, of kind of coming into form with this project is, you know. I'm, I'm just basically already thinking about doing something and then say, hey, <laughs> wouldn't this be a great idea? And hoping and praying. Um, and, and I'm so grateful and thankful that Lania, uh, Lynette and Afia um, joined in and supported the process, even when I was I like- you just made, Danielle, you made us a new name. I like that. Lania. I know, like a brand <laughs> Helena, right? Like, Listen. <laughs> for one. Listen. So I, so, you know, that was really powerful to me because one of the things that I, I, I really um, thought about is, is being a black girl in school and especially um, growing up in um, very rural, one stoplight rural um, North Louisiana is that I didn't, there's, there's no, you know, there was no narrative about um, being a rural black girl um, in, in, in Louisiana with the last name of Pugo. <laughs> so really thinking about how that sort of shaped um, my way of knowing of the teacher, and then also too how that impacted students. So really not really wanting to um, embrace and, and affirm black girls in the school space. When every single thing about the schooling experience, the way I know it, is not affirming you as a black girl. As a matter of fact, in most cases, swiftly rejecting you. And so we saw that with, and I know Lynette just mentioned um, our sister Taylor, um, Bracey um, down in Florida, who was viciously attacked by a grown man, right? And so we we see how we see the importance of why we have, and we know that's not an isolated event, right? So you know we know that these things happen, and um, they're they're becoming more and more 
um, publicized, but it's been going on, right? And so even to think about, you know, how like the, the, the events leading up to this happening, how many times has this person uh, brutally attacked a girl, a young woman? How many times has this happened? Right. And so when we think when I'm when we think about so much that's missing, the 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 point from to which we get to somebody getting body slammed and rendered unconscious, there are things that happen along along Taylor's narrative, whether it be through by, being a bystander to someone else. And so really an opportunity to to really um, un, unfold and sort of untangle these narratives that are so tied into into schools and what we know about black girls. And so it's really, really giving a salute to just the resilience piece. And I know oftentimes, and, and I'm in the teacher preparation space, and so this happens, but I, I in my courses, I talk very openly with students about that, but uh, uh, just about what it means to be a teacher and a teacher of color and a black woman at that, you know, you, you, you're, you're in such a, a space of emotional labor, right? And so we think about what strength means um, we also have to think about the way that we allow for black women to define that, like that, the, the, the beauty of that and how that, how that doesn't have to necessarily look a certain way. So allowing for that um, in the work that we do and then having that translate to how we engage with black girls in these school spaces and acknowledging the lack of affirmation, the lack of just, I see you, like I see you. And I think in all of this, what's great about this book, although it's being published with Teachers College Press, which is often you know, considered a very academic press, the voices in it are very accessible to everybody. <laughs> you know, like, like a middle schooler can pick this book up, read it and connect with it. And so that I think was also really important for us um, as we're thinking about putting the collective voices together is that basically anyone can read this, engage with it and be uplifted by it. Um, so it's really an active tool in that way, not just a book. Absolutely, and I think that speaks so much to um, the contributors offering discussion questions at the end of every single chapter. So if you are um, a practitioner or psychologist or if you're in the, the help helping profession or if you're just a friend of black girls and want to do right by black girls then these are the type of, of, of ways you can start to enter those conversations in your space and so I, I feel like a lot of times and especially now in this in this space and time that we're all living in you know there's such a sense of urgency there's such a sense of, I have to get the right you know, I have to get the right uh, terminology right. I have to get this, I have to say this. I'm, I have to, you know, police how people are, how people c come into their own healing. But really what it's about is the conversation. It's about how we can enter that and how we can begin to set, to, to really see black girls and not just see their pain, not just see, oh, they're strong and they're, they're overcoming, yay. Not that, <laughs> but also seeing how we, Hey, Danielle, we lost your, your volume. No. Oh, but I'm gonna talk Danielle, so <laughs> until you get your sound. You know, strong black girls over here. Yeah, I, I, I'm just really thinking about how fascinating the stories are in this book. I think that that's what even struck me in terms of how can this be used as an educational tool. So I think Danielle was even saying those prompts at the and discussion questions at the end, really causing us to resurrect some of our own experiences and stories that we went through when we were in school, right? In terms of uh, many of the people who are in the chat who study black girls and um, love black girls <laughs> and calling us strong black girls um, can recall certain experiences as well. So shout out to my uh, dissertation advisor, um, Dr. Cynthia Winston Proctor, who's in the chat, who really did a strong training of me as a narrative personality clinical community psychologist, right? To recognize the power of storytelling and of healing and to be inquisitive with the stories and interpret it. I think what the book does as Lynette was implying, it's a really beautiful marriage between um, stories and even poems, but with 
intense theoretical foundation and framework, right? So we can have a story, but then we can also understand, you know, critical Black feminist theories along with that story, right? That that I think it's great complementarity to have authors who are researchers of Black girls tell their schooling experiences that shaped their identity to this day, right? So our identities can be interpreted as an internalized and evolving narrative of self. And so thinking about how people are constructing their sense of self through their school experiences. And in reading these stories, you kind of get more curious about your own saying, I never thought about that silencing piece, right? When my teacher frowned at me each time I raised my hand and how that impacted my motivation and drive to go to school, to study, to um, be curious. Um, if I was getting shut down all the time. So some of the narratives in the book, and especially the ones about hair, I always connect to that. Think about um, how critical it is to, to build a whole and complete story versus the fractured ones that sometimes um, develop within the educational space. All right, Danielle, how's the sound? Testing. Yes. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> That's the black girl resilience right there. I'm gonna jump right back in. <laughs> Absolutely, I, I I echo everything you're saying, and I and and you know I was really really um, I, I was really really hopeful um, in me sort of courting you to 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 help um, edit the volume. That this is the exact piece that you know how you know you know like gosh this needs to be this needs to be I need this perspective. I need someone to tell me what's going on here. Um, without that um, psychology background, uh, really trying to figure out like, how can we look at this in a different way? How can this relate to healing? And how can this also be a, a text that a touchstone for people to refer to when they're discussing some of the concepts and talk topics that we talk about um, in this actual volume? So, so, so grateful. And I mean, I will continue to express that because I can't even believe this is, we're on here right now and we're, we, we finished a project. <laughs> I'm, I'm so just excited about that. So thank you for, for, for saying that. Oh, shout out to my VCU people. Y'all in this chat. Okay. <laughs> so absolutely supportive. And I, you know, and I don't, I don't always do the best job of, of, of like reporting the things that I'm doing and somehow they, they are tuned in and find out and find a way to support me. And I know they've been on Zoom all day with their classes too. So, so love y'all. Shout out to y'all. Wait, wait, Danielle, can you do a, also a shout out to UDC, your your other institution where you started yes! the book? <laughs> but for, but for UDC, this would not be possible, okay? All right, All right. <laughs> UDC, this... UDC in the house. All right. <laughs> you can see. You me from UDC? Okay. <laughs> and now my mom's calling. I'm, my mom is, again, I told you guys, my family in rural North Louisiana, so my mom is, she said, I'll call so I can hear what you were saying because we don't, you know, we, we don't have Wi-Fi and things. So, so she's calling in and I'm going to let her um, just kind of get an earful of what we're saying here because where she's unable to join and, and shout out in the panel, but it's all good. Well, we have some questions in this Q&A. Should we attack oh. them? Um, the first one I'm seeing is, have you considered using this as bibliotherapy in reference to suicide and youth? All right, that that's very um, specific. Yeah, in, in terms of thinking about hope and drive and um, pain, right? When we think about the context of um, suicidality, it's oftentimes the result of severe and significant pain. And we know that our youth are experiencing that. Some of my early training was in studying black male adolescent suicidality. And oftentimes, you know, uh, Black girl stories had been left out of that conversation because of the varying rates. Um, but I definitely think that, again, going to a narrative therapy framework, that there could be inspiration and hopefulness that comes from this narrative of these very successful contributing authors having, have, having significant trauma and working through it. Um, so I'm hoping that it can be useful to give a scope and more depth to again, the traumas that can happen in educational spaces, but also how people navigated it and were able to identify moments of healing and strength and resilience, um, that it's not a simple tone. Yes, pain is part of the narrative. I think pain is part of a lot of the, part of the narratives, but 
um, how do we work through pain and um, thinking about survival in different contexts. So I, I didn't even think about that, but I think I'm gonna add it to my website as part of the bibliotherapy um, reference. And I think that was one of our intent, intentions too, to use it therapeutically for therapists who are specializing in the mental health of black girls in particular. So our next question is from uh, Carla Miller. Carla asks, my fourth grade daughter is learning Virginia studies and is upset almost every day because all she hears about is slavery. How can I talk to her teacher school and school about a more positive way to teach this history that is good for our children? Wow, oh, thank you so much for that. I'm gonna, and I know a few, you're gonna have some, a little more of the clinical lens on this, but I'm just gonna um, speak from my experience as an educator and really trying to um, navigate something similar, which is also just the call for more clinicians and mental health in schools. And so obviously um, the enslavement of Africans is an extremely traumatic thing to relive and to recount and to be a part of your day-to-day um, -day curriculum in school. But I think this, this speaks to a larger um, issue and having these really, really heavy and really, really um, painful things unpacked um, without any type of further processing without any without any um, opportunity and, I, and I'm not saying that you you know you're not um, you know exhausting every possible outlet of therapy or any type of um, response or intervention to her to, to what, the way she's being made to feel um, but I do believe that this is this is just a, a call to have more of that and also the training piece right and I know and I just talked about this in my class uh, where I said you know teachers are we're being asked to do a lot Right. So we're being asked to do a lot. We're being asked to also remain in the profession. But a lot of times we don't have that. So can you also think about the teacher that's 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 feeling like I'm going to, you know, pound away at this narrative in front of these students who may not have this may be the first time we, they've ever heard about that and needing to further process that and needing to have an outlet when you're talking about um, such a deeply traumatic um, generational wound and stain. And so I, I think I think that speaks to the, the teacher training space. Also, if you're going to be talking about topics that are traumatic, you also need to be aware of how to respond to trauma. You also need to be aware of the um, traumatic um, things that could happen when students are being triggered, right? So if I'm a teacher, I don't know if that student has been, you know, experienced something similar to to enslavement. I don't know that. And so me sort of rubbing those wounds, I don't know the response. But what I do know is that when black girls respond in school, when we when we when we when we we've been traumatized, the response to our, tra our trauma has been criminal, right? So we're not allowed to 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 feel in these spaces. And we know the response, you know, thinking about everything that's going on, we know that response. So I think that that this is a, a rallying cry for people to uh, really, really start to petition the people who are creating the standards. And I know that Virginia right now um, has made some great strides in really thinking and, 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 and appointing people and um, developing committees on how to actually talk about this, right? How to acknowledge this and how not to skip over and being in, in close communication with universities and being in close communication with clinicians like Dr. Afia, who I don't think I don't think they've called on you yet, but they need to. So my Virginia people on the line, Afia is amazing. <laughs> and there's many, many other uh, amazing uh, therapists, women of color, friends, people to support that are in this space that absolutely um, want to contribute to that healing process. Can I also add, this is sounds like a little shameless plug, but um, when going to teachers in schools, sometimes they just don't know where the resources are. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm seeing the chat is doing a lot of great, you know, people are sharing podcasts um, links, but also just coming up on Saturday, it's a free event and it's virtual. It's the 29th annual African-American um, Children's Festival. So it's all literature. That's the, the whole entire um, panel and festival is, is talking about the whole focus is black joy um so that's a great place to maybe just 
go like maybe share with the teachers and I'm saying it's a shameless plug because I'm in children's book Arthur and I'm also in it too um but you know there's some great stuff uh young YA artists um or excuse me authors and all the stuff that's being put there is it's none of it is dealing with slavery it's all dealing with like the joy of black lives so that's another great free resource to maybe tell teachers about because um they can get lots of ideas there by just sitting in on some of the panels. Absolutely. And I just want to add one last thing. I, I always think it's interesting how we tell the story of our enslavement in this country. Um, I think that it neglects really key parts of the story. One is why were African people enslaved? Um, oftentimes that's missing. We were enslaved because of our genius level at architecture, at astronomy, at um, cooking, at all these different elements that were needed for the Americas, right? If you want to have someone build your home, who would you pick? An outstanding architect. And I think that this is critical, critical in telling the story of slavery that enslaved Africans were enslaved because of their mastery of the sciences, of math and all of these various pieces. That's a critical piece to it. Another thing I wanna um, reference is um, how oftentimes our resistance is absent from these lessons on slavery, right? And so imagine if just as many um, torturous stories we, we saw or heard, if we heard victorious ones, there are way more slave revolts than um, that are, you know, are not talked about then what happened. So to really think about those stories of resistance um, or just even simple resistances of breaking up glass <laughs> into a slave master's food. So even something as slight as that and to show that, that there were various forms of resistance um, and empowerment even during that time and how people you know were able to get free even moving into the, you know, running into the swamps and just being able to have their own sovereign African culture there, speak their own languages, practice their own spiritual um, practices, you know, so just to give that counter narrative to the one that is typically taught in school. And so that really requires parents studying a lot because I know I'm still learning. <laughs> I'm still learning and trying to be a self-taught historian to really understand the African diaspora and its different timelines and periods. all these jewels of, of amazingness of what you're all saying. So um, I love y'all. Anyway, we have another uh, question by Dr. Arthur Powell. Hey, Arthur, he's a wonderful colleague. So uh, Dr. Powell asks, what advice do you have um, for how educators can strengthen black girls identification with mathematics? I'm, I'm particularly curious about uh, the ideas for working with middle school black and brown girls. That's a great question. Um, I, I think I think there's there's a lot of um, research literature around um, black girls and math acquisition and how um, it, 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 the narrative is is so male uh, leaning. Like this is what boys like to do, so therefore you we don't see you in this space, or we can't see you in this space. I think that goes into what Dr. Afia is talking about in terms of lifting up our magic, lifting up these mathematicians, these black women mathematicians and making them a mainstay around your school campus in your classroom, um, creating these images and these stories about these women's lives. And I'm drawing a blank on the movie that I'm thinking about specifically um, that, 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 that delved into some of these, these, these histories of black women and their incredible contributions to um, the hard sciences community. And I think a lot of times, you know, in the in the training space, the teacher training space, there's not a whole lot. And Lynette said it: the resources. There's a complete um, drop off of resources. So sometimes teachers, yes, hidden figures. Thank you, chat. <laughs> so so really taking the time and opportunity, and even thinking about um, what what Virginia and many many other states are endeavoring to do is having experts, people like Dr. Afia, people that are, are well trained in, in, in un, unpacking these histories. And oftentimes they're right there. It's just like, are we interested? Are we going to center these narratives? How are we gonna, how are we going to, as a school community, 
um, embrace these figures? How are we gonna do that? How are we gonna make them full, full uh, black women with full lives that also happen to be ex experts in these, it, it, you know, in these particular fields? You know, just because we don't see them, it doesn't mean they're not there. <laughs> so I think I think being more intentional about curating resources and being more intentional. So and really matching what we're saying. Um, absolutely, partner hire, and, and and here's one of our authors, uh, Dr. Um, Adams Bass. Partner hire and support Black women who are experts. One more time for the people in the back. Partner hire and support Black women who are experts. So it's not unusual that because I know Dr. Fia that she might know other people that are that are experts in their field. So you know, so it's it's really that you know being unwavering and being intentional and you know really fighting for this has to be no. This is how we're going to engage with mathematics in this class. We are first going to make sure that you see a representation of people that look like you that have some of the sa these same stories and overlaps and where they're from, you know, even connecting, um, even, even, even just walking up to, to universities or, or going through university um, um, listserv or whatever and looking at people that are the pictures and photographs of women who are doing the work and then sending out an email, shameless email, I'm very good at that. <laughs> and asking for that and really and really equipping, I think, um, for me in a teacher education space, really equipping students with that confidence um, to do these things, to be unapologetic, to go that, to say, yes, I did that. And I did that because this matters. And I did that because I see that Black girls are having issues with grappling or having issues seeing themselves and fully participating in this particular subject. So, um, Afia, do you have anything to add to that? Because I, I really think that that's, <laughs> I really think that that's vital. Lynette, I feel like um, we just, I feel like we just like rambling. <laughs> you're, you're asking these great questions. We're just like, oh, I'm glad you asked. First of well, all, no, I kept, I kept thinking first about. First of all, <laughs> I kept thinking about this question because just personally i love math yeah. um i'm great at math don't ask me geometry and proofs not not a fan but give me calc give me give me algebra give me all of that but i'm also thinking that like in my own schooling experiences i actually my eighth grade teacher went to bat for me and was like no she needs to be in higher math it was my parents who held me back because they had their own assumptions about math and what that was like. So she's not, she's not good at it. She won't do well, all these things, but like I thrived in math. Um, I like secretly want to be a quantitative researcher and I've done some quantitative stuff, but most people don't know that just because there's this like concept. So even familiarly, that for me was running into the school environment because of really the own traumas of really my mother around math, you know, for her. So um, that's why I was just kind of lost in thought with this question, because it was bringing about this idea. But truthfully, that connects to the book, because the book is, you know, people are rethinking some of these experiences, and then how are they making sense of them? So I just did that live on Zoom. <laughs> Next question we have is from Dr. Alan Amsis, and hi, Alan, who's another colleague from TCNJ and dear friend. Uh, Dr. Amsis asks, based on your histories and those of the chapter are authors, are there themes or shared experiences that you can identify as resilience, resiliency factors that helped you and the authors resist the push to be submerged? I'm sure it's in the book, but I haven't read it yet. <laughs> Well, make sure you read it. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> um, Lynette, can do you, can you read? Yeah. That? So th there are there are a, cu a couple of themes, right? We the the book is actually broken up into themes. So I'll just read them for everybody. The first theme is about revoicing the silence in schools. The second theme is about uh, black feminine bodies in schools. And the third one is embracing and complicating hashtag black girl magic. What was interesting, I will say initially when we got all of the 85 chapters um, was there was, a, there was a big theme of black girls being in white schooling spaces. 
um, and all the traumas around that. And a lot of the concepts of resiliency, they, they, well, they looked different, but there were a number of having a um, outside program or like an after school program or having a mentor, like there was someone else to try to ground them within these experiences. So that was definitely one thing that we're seeing over and over again. The other thing that we saw was around black bodies, right? Black girls are often, you know, put adultification, right? Of bodies, sexualizing of bodies. We saw a lot of that. So there's, there's a whole you know, subsection there. Um, what is interesting is one of our chapters actually goes over, well, we have hair, right? So we have two, <laughs> my colleagues here who write about hair, um, hair in schools. But there's another chapter in here who talks um, specifically about um, sexual education, right? And, and brings forth tools and curriculum stuff around that. But th those were two very powerful themes you know, black girls in white spaces and adultification of the black body, um, you know, or just inappropriateness around black body, you know, including hair with that, that we were seeing. Definitely, I, I think for me, um, one of the things I kind of, um, one of the chapters really helped me to um, process and I, I have it here, um, which is Autumn's chapter, which, uh, you know, the struggle for Black girl voice, a story of three generations, right? And so I think it, it, it really helped me sort of unravel my, uh, my like origin story of where I'm from and the beliefs about um, women, Southern Black women. And so from a very young age, you're, you're socialized to uh, I, I know in my particular context to be one day be a good mom and a good wife and then aspire to that. And there's nothing, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But I think a lot of times it was sort of cloaked in this idea of, you know, your, your everything about your life needs to um, align with, you know, being uh, married and partnered or, or it needs to be going on that trajectory. And anything that is in collision, in, in direct head on collision with that idea is not good. So we must suppress that part of you um, that is, is, is sort of, you know, like we, we hear the, 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 the stereotypes about black women and, and everything else, but I think that like suppression piece, that sort of silencing, um, is, was definitely a, a theme of how we need to, of how black girls are, are socialized where I'm from or how I, I was, you know, how that sort of hit me. It's like, wow, you know, I have to do, I, I need to do a whole lot of changing about who I am <laughs> in order to, to remain, you know, remain desirable in order to, um, you know, achieve um, society's ideals of, of what a family and what that situation looks like. And I, so I, I, and I think that absolutely also um, was a theme throughout my educational experiences and people telling me, I, I remember um, um, shortly after Hurricane Katrina, um, I was doing what was I doing? I think I was like doing observations and then like you have like this class you're gonna like eventually take over. Um, I think I would may have been a methods or something like that. And I remember the evaluation, I still have it, where the evaluator said, great lesson, great energy, but why are you so loud? Like you don't have to be that loud when you're giving instructions. And you know, so I so so there there was the reconfirming of you know, you're, you're creating a problem for yourself. Why won't you just like, just squeeze in and, and conform and be, and not really be yourself instead of, you know, having, instead of embracing that part about you and figuring out how to elevate that part um, and how that, that's so powerful for students to see, especially, you know, your black girls that you're teaching in the class. So I, I think that really hit me um, and really helped me process a lot about that, that sort of narrative and how it's, how it's so so tightly woven into um, traditions and norms, and for Black women, it's you know it's it's really it, it can be it can be extremely um, suffocating. All right, this one might be for you, Afia, because I know you do a lot around the you know thinking about the Crown Act and stuff like that. So this question is saying, um, this is from Adrian Castro, and the question is, how do you envision this work impacting and or informing educational policy? Oh, excellent. Um, 
Yes, I, I think a major push for the Crown Act was all of the experiences that made it to the news and didn't make it to the news where there was there were unfair grooming and dress codes um, for, related to black girls in terms of there are actually school dress codes that exist to this day saying black girls can't wear braids to school. Black girls can't wear locks to school um, for boys too, but even thinking about braids being so central to um, the cultural experience. And so Danielle and I have really brainstormed um, the, the educational policy changes in terms of the criteria of cultural competence, anti-bias teaching, but even then the enforcement of the Crown Act. So the Crown Act, again, is basically um, an anti-discrimination law or bill that uh, outlaws um, children being regulated and adults um, in terms of access to education based on their hairstyle and particularly natural hairstyle, right? So locks, braids, twists, afros. As we know, there is no relationship between um, the score, the, the score that someone can attain on a test um, and how long or short their hair is, right? And so we really need to scour these school policies at the, the local level, but even at the national level have um, rules and regulations. So even last week I testified for the Crown Act in Delaware, which did pass, but one of the criticisms of it, of one of the um, community members in Delaware said, well, at my school, it's a military school, right? And there needs to be a military code, but even the military is changing <laughs> their policy. So these things are really outdated. And I think too, with like Black Lives Matter movement and other factors that people are really questioning the existing policies that are extremely biased against Black aesthetics, Black beauty, Black bodies. And so um, I'm just going at it from that, that aesthetic piece of the Crown Act. But as we know that um, black children are suspended at such higher rates, all these different factors, and really call it what it is, racism, right, and white supremacy, and to really be able to confront it and dismantle um, it, not only through policy, but policy is only as good as its enforcement, right, and so to really make sure that people are informed and competent enough to be able to enforce those policies. I know I'm, I'm I get excited about the Crown Act, but in terms of there needs to be other Black girl specific um, policies because of how uh, rejecting um, those spaces are. And just see, even thinking about the, the, the rates at which Black women and girls are attaining uh, higher degrees that we need to even then review what were the obstacles and challenges and create policy around that. Yes, I want to say shout out to Dr. Castro, Dr. Castro, who's a colleague of mine here at BCU. Um, and we actually have a paper that's uh, in formation and will be out soon. So, um, you know, if, if, please everybody stay in touch and, and, and follow our moves. You know, I'm not on social media, but, you know, when, <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I'm happy to have an email. I know Dr. Castro and everybody on here is happy to get an email. Um, just to stay in touch and, 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 and stay current on any recommendations about um, um, readings and things like that. So thank you so much. All right. I think we are going to have a lot to say about this question. It says to all the panelists, um, this is an anonymous post. What advice do you have for Black female graduate students who are committed to centering the love and joy of Black girls, but receive negative pushback from academia and society? Ooh! <laughs> How much time we got, Emily? That, that's that's our next book. <laughs> how, much, how much time we got? Because <laughs> this was K through twelve. We got to get to that that higher education piece, strong black girls in higher ed. Ooh. Yeah. So anybody on the anybody in the chat that wants to like you know keep the movement going, feel free to like say, hey, I'm willing to edit that. <laughs> All right. So yesterday. I got a call from a former student um, at an institution I used to teach at, <laughs> name, nameless, and um, she's a black female and um, is doing amazing work and was calling and was like, look, I, I really need advice because my advisor is not helping me, is not supporting me, I'm drowning, I'm not finding out information. Is it okay to change advisors? So let's start there. <laughs> the answer is yes. 
You are paying for this with your money and your time and your energy. Um, you know, a dissertation can break a soul <laughs> if you're not careful. Um, so let's start there. So if you're in a situation, you know, in academia where your advisor is not supporting your work um, and not around you, you have you can change your advisor. I know people get upset with that whole, you know, the graduate student life of, you know, all these people have power and in some ways they do, but you are also empowered too. And so know that you have that way to advocate for yourself to get somebody else who will uplift you and who will support your work. Um, if they're not in house, you are allowed to bring people from outside in. So Hello, all at us, but <laughs> Lynette, and I want to, oh, we have time to tell this story? Because it's like, Lynette, oh my gosh. Okay, so, you know, I I was, I did my graduate um, work, uh, my PhD work in uh, Wisconsin, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Shout out to all my Milwaukee people. Um, but, you know, Milwaukee isn't a place where there's like an abundance of, uh, well, there are a lot of Black people in Milwaukee, but like in that academic space, there's not an abundance of, of Black women and Black people. And, um, I was fortunate enough to connect with um, a colleague who at the time was, was there and studying um, critical theory and race and sp more specifically um, suspensions, disproportionate suspensions um, with students of color. And so um, I kept in touch with him. And I, one day I emailed him out of the blue. I'd already graduated and moved on to the, uh, um, this uh, faculty role at, in, in DC. And I was just rambling to him like, oh, this is happening, this is happening, this is happening. And so he's like, oh, I, how about you call my friend Lynette? So never knew anything about Lynette, never met Lynette before in my life. So I, I out of the blue, um, email her, hey, you know, I, I was connected through, through this person. Um, I'm really struggling with just trying to find people to collaborate with. Oh, your, your volume went out again. Oh, hold on. What's happening? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Good. Obviously, I can't move too much on this computer, so I'm just gonna. Um, but I ended up um, emailing Lynette. Lynette emails right back and says, "Hey, what are you doing the weekend of like the fourth? And I'm like, um, "Nothing." She's like, "Okay, I'm booking my train ticket and I'm coming there. Never met her, never talked to her before in life." Um, and then Lynette comes. I pick her up at Union Station. Um, and we proceed to go to the library um, at UDC and we like work for six hours. When I tell you I left with two manuscripts, <laughs> um, a book proposal, a chapter, and I, I went to the bathroom after she, after I dropped her off and left, it, left her at, um, dropped her off at, at, um, at the metro station or the train station, I went in the bathroom and I cried because I'm, I, it, to me, it was just like, how could someone be so, how could someone do this? And I know lots of times, you know, when you're the only faculty member somewhere, you're, we're completely like, like, you know, emotionally tapped out, like completely, everybody's like, oh, this is the, you know, the, the, the black professor, let's go to the support, let's do this. And so even thinking about people who are really, you know, walking and talking, thinking about what does dismantling white supremacy and racism look like at an institutional level? Well, it looks like hiring people that can take some of this labor and service away from us, the people that everybody's calling for everything, that's what it looks like. It looks like, you know, putting that, it looks like paying us, you know, <laughs> you're paying us uh, the salary that we deserve in order to do this work and having that recognition. And I think that's been, you know, that was my, my experience. And so I think a lot of times we have to really, um, we have to really uh, go outside. Like Lynette said, sometimes it's not there. And, you know, I was very fortunate in that situation, but, you know, sometimes you never know. You never know what might happen. This may build a relationship and here, here we are. Like, here we are. <laughs> so, you know, I just, that's, that's like a, a little sliver of hope. And I just, I just hope, and, I, and, I, and I'll be thinking about you, you know, I'll be thinking about all my sisters on here that are in this same space. I'm going to be thinking about you and I'm going to tell my mom to pray for y'all too, because that was another part that got me through. Like when I was telling my mom, my mom's not an academic. My mom's been in the health profession for years, but she's like, okay, okay. You don't have anybody. That's fine. Somebody will come. So. 
And, and you, you all are that somebody. I just, I know Danielle's being humble as well, but she studies peer mentorship in black female graduate students, how that is a survival mechanism to have your crew. So whether within university or across university to recognize that there are, there are a lot of us who are learning together, right? And so I even see Cynthia Thomas, who's one of my graduate school uh, colleagues that we were in a lab together, right? Now she's in Louisiana, but we can still communicate and text and she showed up to this day, right? So thinking about you read my dissertation proposal, I read yours. Let's you know study for comps together. I know that was a big piece of my educational experience in graduate school to have such a support network amongst my friends and my peers um, and have study groups and be <laughs> critical of each other, right? And give some feedback. So even amongst this, I almost feel like we replicated between Danielle and Ed and I in terms of having those exchanges and through a book. I felt like I got a lot of peer mentorship. I never did a book before. Lynette's like, okay, first we do this, this, this. Yes. And so to even recognize that she, because she has gone through this process with others, she was able to bring that information back to us. And here we are today. So thank you um, for our collective as well. Yes. Um, yeah. And and you you really have to find your 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 sister girls. Like find them wherever they may. And they may not look like, you know, you may have to. You know, you may have to adopt the person that really might not be a sister, but if they're willing to support you in that space, they may have to come into the fold and do what they have to do. So really getting away from the idea of this has to look a certain way, it has to come out, this has to be the outcome, but taking it wherever you can get it, um, I think is key. You know, I've, I've had a, a, an older um, black male gentleman to be my mentor. And, you know, that's worked out great for me because he, he actually ended up being sort of like a, a, a father figure and with respect and just really helping me along that process. Um, so, so being open to those people that you may not think, even people who are not faculty, even people who you just see in passing it, who may be in the financial aid office, who may be, you know, in, in campus services, who may be in environmental services, every little bit of support, every little nugget, every little girl, I, I will never forget the first time I um I was at in a few you know how our offices are Lynette I, did I take it to my office when you came up there no because we just went to the library oh yeah <laughs> but Afia you know how our offices are and I I will never forget like coming to coming in my office and they had put the placard up there you know Fugo and there was a, a a woman who I still I'm like you you know Afia anybody any person could be like like roll up in UDC and be like look teach me. So we treat everybody like they could be a student <laughs> because we, we interface with them, we're kind, um, treat everybody the same. And so she, she, I was unlocking the door and she was just walking by and she said, she was like, do you work here? I said, mm. she said, what do you do? I've never seen you. I said, well, I'm a professor. That lady cried. Wow. She cried. She cried and I, I've never, it, and, and so I, I think oftentimes we, we sometimes, those little moments of like, you know, even if you're overlooked or people are, you know, discounting your accomplishments or telling you, you know, you won a prestigious award. And this is, these are all true stories. You won a prestigious award, but all anybody can talk about is, you know, the way you look or, oh, I like that or this. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. But when those things have beat you down in that particular space, those little moments really matter. So though, and, 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 and as emotional as it was, I was like, dang, and I just, you know, I, 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 was, I was on the verge of quitting, mm -hmm. so. And I, and I think with, with, with all of this is, you know, to the person who, who wrote this question, you know, finding your people and getting through, I'll say in grad school, I didn't have any good mentorship. So it was, it was our collective of friends trying to figure it out. And even when I left, I'm like, okay, I'm here in this academic job. How do I publish an article? I don't know what to do. So like we, we figured it out together, but the other important thing is lift as you climb. So as we started to figure out, like making sure that you, per, you do be those mentors for those who are, who are, you know, who are coming up in the ranks and that you can have information to provide. So um, I certainly live by that ethos and that's what's truthfully going to make us all stronger. And with that, 
What, what an optimistic note. Uh, I wish we had I wish we had two more hours together. Thank, thank you all so much for your insights and uh, thank you to our listeners for your wonderful questions. Um, this has been this has been so wonderful and uh, and we we so appreciate everyone's time today celebrating this this wonderful work. So please do um, buy a copy of Strong Black Girls and uh, let's let's continue the conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Take care.